most consumers, businesses, customers, they're not really excited about working with a startup. They don't get joy out of trying new technology just for the sake of new technology. Instead, what they're looking for is, can you solve my problem? And can you do it significantly better than I could otherwise do it? And I'm saying like five to 10x better than what's currently out there. Welcome to 30 Years in 30 Minutes, the podcast that distills decades of wisdom and success into bite-sized, inspiring conversations. My name is Michael Ovid, the host of the podcast. Along with Terrence Gable, I sit down with the world's most accomplished individuals and hear their stories of grit and determination. How did they rise to the top? What is the key to their success? How did they overcome the obstacles that they faced along the way? You will learn all that and more on 30 Years in 30 Minutes. Today's podcast guest, actually our first guest ever, is Sarah Laird. Sarah is the co-founder of Nextdoor, the free and private social network for neighborhoods. Nextdoor went public in 2021 at a $4.3 billion valuation. She's also a venture partner on Unusual Ventures with a focus on Unusual's consumer practice. Before then, she served as the vice president of product and marketing at ePinions and Shopping.com before the company was sold to ePin. Sarah is a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Business School. Sarah, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me and congratulations on launching this great podcast. Obviously, you've accomplished a lot. What motivated you to become an entrepreneur? You know, it, it's funny, Terrence, that you asked that because I, I think, obviously, I've spent the last 20 some odd years as an entrepreneur and as a founder. And yet, if I look back, going back 30 years, I can safely tell you that wasn't the grand plan. Uh, in fact, I don't I don't think I had a grand plan. And um, in fact, I, I started my career working for a bigger company, maybe not as big as it is today, but by working at Microsoft and uh, was lucky enough to get into technology early in my career. And that I really have to thank my experience in college. I was studying economics and I happened to take a class that looked at the economics of the software industry when I was a sophomore. And while I really liked technology, I got even more excited about the possibilities. And it became clear to me, even at that early stage, that we were in the beginning of a huge trend where computers were going to drive lots of different parts of our economy and software was going to be at the heart of that. And, and so I was drawn to that. And I think it's part of the reason why I ended up going and doing an internship at Microsoft between my junior and senior year in college. And I think above everything, I was drawn to the fast paced nature, the high growth and the exceptional quality of people that were involved in technology and specifically at Microsoft. And even at that early stage, I felt like the work that I was doing could have an impact. And, and I think that's what really drew me into first technology and uh, eventually to joining, joining Microsoft and seeing how a high growth company operated, being around people who were shaping the world and having the opportunity to have a seat at the table to impact that. That's what drew me to technology. And over time, I just got inspired by what was possible and felt that joining in a smaller, earlier stage company was a place where I could have an even bigger impact. But uh, you know, to answer your, your original question, it wasn't, it wasn't the grand plan per se. Uh, but now that I look back, it, it seems obvious that I ended up as an entrepreneur and I think part of it goes back to having grown up in a family of entrepreneurs and small business owners. And what that really just taught me was don't be afraid to bet on yourself. What type of businesses did your family run? You know, it, it ran the gamut from running a automobile dealership, being in the food brokerage business, uh, running a sales company for small office machines. Uh, it wasn't the fanciest stuff in the world, but what I really took away from it was how so many people who I grew up around, my 
grandmother, my uncle, my dad, they all were willing to go out on their own, bet on themselves and build their own company. And I don't even think I understood that that was unusual at the time, but I just grew up around people who were willing to bet on themselves and to create opportunities for other people as well. Sarah, you said that you didn't really have a grand plan when you came out of college. If you're speaking to college students who kind of strive to create that grand plan, how they can plan out their entire life to end up in a position like you were, what would you tell them? Don't do it. <laughs> the grand plan from the beginning is, is silly. And, and part of the reason that I say that is that the world is changing so fast. And I think for, for young people coming out of college right now, there's just a, a world of opportunity. I, just to imagine, I didn't, we didn't know that the internet was going to exist when I was graduating from college. But being open to the possibilities was one way that I could take advantage of what unfolded in front of you. So I, I really just encourage people to, to, number one, carve their own path. Like you can't take someone else's playbook and use it for yourself. And put yourself in a position where you're increasing your amount of learning, you're learning the hard skills early on, and then at every opportunity, you're looking at what is the best learning opportunity for me to take for this next step. I think too often, if you have a grand plan, you will say no to opportunities when it knocks because it wasn't part of your original plan. And at least for, for me, it may look like, oh, going to work at Microsoft was an obvious choice, but when I joined, there were a couple thousand employees. It was in the early stages, and I left New England to go out to Redmond, Washington, to a small software company that a lot of people hadn't heard of. And yet, that turned out to be an incredible opportunity that opened up the doors and created a platform for me to have a great career that worked for me. I think that's the other part. Like, be honest with yourself about what's going to make you happy, what's going to make you successful, and what's going to give you energy, because that's where you're going to have the opportunity to be world class. And that's not the same for every person. And even you look at my career, I didn't jump right into entrepreneurship. I worked for a company that had high quality people, had a great market opportunity, and I learned incredibly valuable skills in my first five years that I've then taken and pulled forward throughout my career. So it's okay to start at a bigger company or even a large company because you want to brush up on skills, you want to develop insights. You want to learn from other people and then progressively move to an earlier stage company. So I, I think for a lot of people, okay, if you don't do it right out of school, have you missed the opportunity? Absolutely not. I think the most important thing that you can do when you graduate, because when you graduate, you have a bunch of raw skills, but go find some applied skills, learn some really hard skills that will put you in a position to see the types of problems that you can solve over the course of the next 5, 10, 15 years. I think it's one of the things that people early in their career, and even when they're in college, like don't miss the opportunity to expand your skill set. Maybe in college, that's around taking a statistics course, learning how to analyze data. There's people doing research, go work with a professor. Go learn how to write code, understand how AI works. These are all things that I think are going to be valuable and uh, areas of incredible growth over your lifetimes. And if you miss the opportunity when you're in college to take classes or be a part of clubs, be involved in a startup, perhaps you're missing out on the things that are, are the buffet of opportunities that are available to you right in front of you at your own school. And, and that's, um, it becomes much harder to acquire those skills when you're out of college and you're working and you have family and you have other things going on. In college, it's, believe it or not, it's the easiest time to do it. Yeah. 
and just to go back to something you said before about growing up and and your family and the work ethic that they had beyond family we always hear about the importance of surrounding yourself with people that are similar to you with people with drive after all you go into a flower shop you walk out smelling like flowers you walk into a garbage dump and you'll end up smelling like garbage to what extent do you think surrounding yourself or surrounding oneself with good people, with people with drive, with innovation, with imagination, is critical to people's eventual success. I'm so glad you brought that up, Michael, because I think so much of life's path is figuring out who you're working with, who you are working for, and also just who you have in your in your life. One of the things that I spent a lot of time doing when I was in college is I played lacrosse. Um, and I was very lucky to be on a terrific team, a national championship team. And when you have that opportunity early in your life to be around talented people and to see the the benefits of being a part of a world-class team, um, it's hard for you not to carry that forward in everything that you do. And I think a big reason why I ended up at Microsoft for my first five years of my career was because of the experience that I had during that summer and being around very smart, highly motivated people who helped to push me to reach for for greater things. And and that was something that I've really held throughout my entire career. It has uh, guided me in terms of the startups that I've chosen to join and even the co-founders that I've worked with. And and frankly, it's probably the most important decision that you can make, who you are working with, who you can learn from, who you want to be on the journey with, because not only will it help you in terms of decision making and, and uh, pushing forward, but you want to find the people who give you energy to keep going. In any journey, especially the entrepreneurial journey, having the staying power to be able to keep going is absolutely essential. And a big part of that is who you are working with. How would you recommend someone find their co-founders? Because obviously you you found your co-founders at a previous company you worked at, if I'm not incorrect, and then you guys stayed in touch. And That's right, Terrence. My uh, co-founder, Nir of Tolia, and I worked together at Epinions. He was one of the co-founders of that company, the CEO. And before we started next door, we started with, we wanted to work together. And, and so I recommend for people, one of the best ways to find your co-founders is to work together. This is why picking where you're going to start your career, that's going to create your community of people who you are working with. And it may not be that person, but they may introduce you to another person. Um, It's also a a great opportunity while you're in school to work on projects together. I don't think there's any real shortcut to learning what it's like to work with people than to just work with them. Uh, You can do the speed dating and talk to someone, but it's not how what people talk about, it's what they actually do in uh, under the heat of the situation, right? And in the case with Nirav, we had worked together for almost six years through lots of ups and downs, and we knew each other's strengths, we knew how to complement each other, we knew that we enjoyed spending time working on the hard problems together, and, and that became the foundation of our work together as co-founders. Can you tell us a bit about that journey? You said that the journey with your co-founder was filled with ups and downs um, until you ended up founding Nextdoor. Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, I'd love to tell you that, you know, one day we woke up and we had the idea for Nextdoor and it was fully formed in our heads and and off to the races that we went. Um, It is far from that. Uh, We actually were entrepreneurs and residents working together on new ideas. So we first decided we were going to work together. And we actually started with a different idea, the idea of a company called Fanbase, which you probably haven't heard of, but it was designed to be the world's largest almanac for college and pro sports fans. We raised a bunch of money, built a team. We built the product over the course of 18 months, finally launched it uh, to a lot of acclaim and uh, got up to 15 million unique visitors. 
But within a few months, it was clear looking at the data that we did not have product market fit despite all the traffic that we were getting. People were bouncing and they were leaving pretty quickly. We spent about six months trying to, quote unquote, figure it out and fix the problem. And uh, at the end of that, we actually didn't think that we were on to the next big thing. And we offered to give the money back to our lead investor, Bill Gurley. And uh, he actually pushed back. He said, look, I bet on the team. Why don't you guys take the summer and work on some new ideas and see if there's something you're more excited about doing. And and that started what is now known as the, the pivot, where we explored multiple ideas in parallel. And uh, during that time, we uh, came across the idea and the inspiration for what became Nextdoor. Um, and through a lot of things that we now would describe as the lean startup approach, where you test and iterate before you actually build, uh, within about three months, we built a simple prototype and launched it in one neighborhood and saw positive feedback from day one, but a lot of twists and turns along the way uh, before we eventually decided that next door was going to be the the idea that we were going to jump on. And it looks obvious in hindsight. We were people who understood how to build online community from our days at Opinions. Uh, we were at a point in our lives where neighborhoods made a lot of sense um, because we cared about them in our own lives. But um, you had to work the problem and figure out a solution that could work that made sense. And I'm a big believer that the way that you do that is by testing and iterating that in market, not sitting in an office with a whiteboard and designing it up. Um, you know, through simple uh, simple mock-ups or, or even just building something and launching and hoping that that the community will come. And, uh, and so I, I just think about that journey, which frankly took over three years. And the only way that you can go through an experience like that and stick together as a team is because you like and trust one another. And, and that's why I think the people and who you have around the table is uh, as important, if not more important, than the specific idea that you go after. You mentioned how you talked to Bill Gurley and you offered to give the capital back. Do you remember what your plan was going to be if you had given it back? Was it to go work in big tech or what, what was the plan there? Terrence, when you are a founder, you are 100% focused on that, that company. Yeah. Uh, it's not a, a job that you can be like, oh, I'm going to do this job for a little while and then I'm going to pivot in another direction. You have put a lot of your life force into trying to stand up a, a company. You've convinced investors to come on board. You've recruited people to join us. We had a team of 10 when we made that decision. Um, you've made a commitment to your co-founders. You've made a commitment to your users and your community. And so... We were very much trying to figure out how best to move the company forward. And so it wasn't a simple, oh, I'm going to go off and go find another job. I, I think it's something that is important for young people to understand is there's an enormous amount of responsibility when you embark in being an entrepreneur and founding a company. And a lot of people put their trust and faith in you, whether they're investing money or their time as an employee and, and even your, your customers and your users. And so it's not something to take lightly. Oftentimes someone will ask, oh, well, there's such a high failure rate and with a startup. And I say, yeah, that's true. But actually what I ask founders is, are you prepared if this is successful? Because if it's successful, you're on potentially a 10-year journey. If you're doing this just to start a company and go through the early phases and maybe raise some money and then you're going to go to another, like, it's not the right career path. You have to be comfortable with committing a lot of your waking hours and time and energy and reputation to making a company successful. And that oftentimes these days takes five, seven, ten years. And so it's it's not for the faint of heart. And it's one of the reasons why you you 
You better feel really motivated by the problem you're trying to solve and the people with whom you are on the journey. Those are very important ingredients. Otherwise, you won't have the staying power necessary to be successful. So you mentioned that this will inevitably be a journey with ups and downs. The thing is, is that a lot of entrepreneurs are scared to start companies because they fear failure. <laughs> what would you tell? I mean, it's just exactly like you said, they need to weigh, they need to weigh success and failure against each other. But what would you tell them? Um, those entrepreneurs who are scared of failure. Yeah, it's probably one of the things that I talk about the most, especially with, um, with students in college who are thinking about entrepreneurship. And they're looking for the checklist to like, well, I, I want to be successful at this, especially if you've been successful in your entire life up until that point. And um, the interesting thing, of course, is that there is no one who has succeeded in life without taking the risk and experiencing failure along the way. We oftentimes smooth that over in the narrative of telling their success story, but to a person, they will tell you that you, you learn from the failures and you adapt. And I think in modern life, it, it seems like everything has to go perfectly and you can't uh, embrace failure. And, and I think it holds people back from even trying. So one of the things that I encourage students and folks right out of school, like, don't be afraid to try, especially if you're in school. Like, what a great... That's what college is all about. It's about trying things and pushing yourself and exploring and figuring out what really works for you. So taking the risk and, and learning whether or not something works, I think that's actually the fastest way to make progress. Um, but too often people will, won't even get out of the starting block to think about trying because they're like, well, what if I fail? I guarantee you, you're going to experience failure. But the question is how quickly you can adapt and learn from it. And, and frankly, I think it's a faster path to learning than everything going smoothly and everything being up and to the right. So um, getting comfortable with failure. And, and I'm not suggesting that someone goes out looking for failure. To me, it's much more of the scientific method of how do we try things and learn whether or not it works and then adapt very quickly. And so that's what some people would describe as design thinking. How can I construct these tests so I can learn really, really fast based on market feedback? And that's where I think if people can embrace that approach to things, they will learn much faster than if they try and just huddle up in a conference room and come up with all the answers themselves. When it next door, did you realize that you really had hit product market fit? I remember listening to you in another interview. You mentioned the story that you went out to lunch for 15 minutes and your phone <laughs> blew up. Was that when you kind of realized that you guys had hit a big? That was a that was definitely a defining moment. And um, just to to share the details of that, we only had 15 neighborhoods at the time, and every product support was basically people texting, email me, or calling me. And uh, Terrence, the, the moment that you're referring to is is a day in which we were making changes to the database and had to take the website down for a little while. Uh, and we happened to do it right before lunch. And we wanted to do it in the middle of the day because it was easier for the engineers. And we thought there's not that many people on the platform. It won't be a big deal. We take the database down. We go for lunch. And within 15 minutes, there's a phone call saying, why is next door down? I'm trying to get in touch with my neighbors. And you're like, wow, they need us, right? This isn't it's a nice app. This is something that they need to have. And I think it was it was a sharp departure from our experience with fan base where we felt like we had built something that was a nice to have, uh, but not an essential part of people's lives. And, you know, in those early days, you're looking for any sign that people care about what you're working on, that if you went away, they would miss it. And that was, that happened to be a funny moment when we were all together at lunch. And so lunch ended quickly and, uh, and we were back in the office 
uh, and brought the platform back up to speed and uh, and everything was was fine. But it was just one of those moments where you feel like, wow, we matter to people. They're counting on us. And if you fast forward several years later to a, a really difficult time uh, in Houston when Hurricane Harvey came through Houston and really caused a lot of damage, knocked out 911. It was next door was the way that people were getting help from their neighbors. There was one example where someone needed an EpiPen and put out a message on next door because there was so much flooding you couldn't leave your house. And sure enough, a neighbor came paddling over in a canoe and provided the EpiPen in time for one of their neighbors. And so, um, you just think about that and like what an honor it is to have a platform that can be that helpful in a time of need. And also the responsibility that comes along with you're becoming part of the social infrastructure of a community during a time of an emergency. And I, I think that's probably one of the things that I'm most proud of with Nextdoor. I mean, it's, it's, it's clear that it's been, and, and like we spoke about before, it's clear it's been, you know, a fun ride. Um, there's a lot of, and we spoke a bit about students, college students, recent graduates, what they can do. But oftentimes, if you're in your late 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, anything really, it's very difficult to leave your lifestyle, leave your comfortable lifestyle with a stable salary and constant income when you have people depending on you to then start a company and undergo the tumultuousness that is inherent to entrepreneurship. What would you tell people like that? Michael, it's it's a great point. And uh, as much as I have enjoyed the entrepreneurial journey, I think that people need to go into it with their eyes wide open and recognize that it's not for everyone. Um, there is self-sacrifice. There is a lot of risk associated with it. And it's one of the reasons why I encourage young people to try it out. Try it out when you're in college. Try it out when you just graduate. And really pay attention to whether or not you enjoy the chaotic nature of a startup. Um, because for some people, they want more stability. They want to know, like... If I do this, I'll get promoted and it moves in a very linear path. And so I, I think it's an intensely personal question. I'm not going to sugarcoat it and tell you, oh, no, anyone can do a startup at any point in time in their life. They can, but you got to go in with your eyes wide open and understand that it's not a path to take simply because you think you're going to be a huge success and, and make money. Like, that's a crazy reason to go into being an entrepreneur. Really, you should be motivated by you see that there is a gap in the world. There is a problem in the world. And there is a desperate need for a better solution. And you have an insight about how to provide that solution. If you don't see that opportunity where there is a real need in the market, it would be crazy to quit a stable job and just go on a journey to start a company for the sake of starting the company. I Just think about this for a second. Most consumers, businesses, customers, they're not really excited about working with a startup. They don't get joy out of trying new technology just for the sake of new technology. Instead, what they're looking for is, can you solve my problem? And can you do it significantly better than I could otherwise do it? And I'm saying like 5 to 10x better than what's currently out there. If you're an early stage company, you're a startup, or you're just new technology, wow, I have to learn something new. I've got to work with a new partner. Like there's a lot of risk inherent in that. And so people are willing to make that leap and customers are willing to change if you can provide a solution that is obviously and significantly better than their alternative. And so if there's not a real need in the world, stop. Because 
there's just too much risk in starting a company just to start a company. That That's kind of a, a fool's errand. But I think that these are things that you can experiment with, you can explore while you're in college. And the reality is, if it doesn't work out, you're on to the next. But you learn something about, did I enjoy that work? Did I like working with these people? Am I intrigued by these problems? So let's say that you missed the boat in college, but you're interested in entrepreneurship. You're really passionate about starting a company. What now? I think, as I, I've mentioned, I think you got to find the person with whom you want to work with and then find ways to start thinking about the unsolved problems in the world and whether or not you can come up with a solution that will that will address that. Um, I think one of the biggest mistakes that people make is that they maybe find a technology, they have an idea, but they haven't validated that the market needs it. And so I would I would start there. I think in this day and age, there's so many people out there, whether it's a studio or an accelerator, an angel group, like being in the startup ecosystem can take many forms. And if you're curious about it, Go spend time working with one. And maybe you do it in your free time while you're still doing your day job. And if you start to find yourself like, wow, I'm enjoying doing this after work thing a lot more than my day job, that's probably telling you that you have a sincere interest in working in a in a startup. But uh, again, just go in with your eyes wide open because um, it's not a quick journey. Sarah, you've mentioned a bunch how important it is to work with great people. Either what advice would you give to someone looking for a co-founder? Like, how did you identify that your co-founders were great fits for you or just anything along that line? Because, again, that is so important. You know, I, I think there's some traditional things that you should look for. It's nice to have complementary skills uh, versus overlapping skills. It's nice to have similar interests in terms of problems that you want to solve. But I, I think that the real magic just comes from how you work together, how you show up for each other, and how you really, like, interact. And frankly, I used to joke when I lived in San Francisco, oh, you think you want to start a company with someone? Short of having already worked with them or worked on a project together, I would tell people, well, why don't you take a road trip from San Francisco to Las Vegas together? And and see if you still like each other at the end. And it's did you guys do that? <laughs> I've taken a lot of road trips with my co-founder, so um, it wasn't to Las Vegas, but uh, we, we battle tested that one quite a bit, uh, mostly to to Italy, to be honest with you. Um, but if you think about a road trip, you got to pick where you're going. You got to pick how you're going to get there. You got to pick who's driving. You got to pick when someone's going to step in for each other. You got to figure out what's the music that you're going to play. Are you going to stop every hour? Are you going to stop and have lunch? Are you going to take a detour? These are all joint decisions that you have to make together. And you're in a really confined, closed area for long periods of time. Uh, what are you going to talk about? And do you enjoy each other's company on a 10-hour road trip? So. I, I use that as a metaphor, but I think it, it actually pertains to coming up with making joint decisions and really what do you value? So a lot of this comes down to values, but I'm a much bigger fan of actually testing those values versus just talking about them. I think that people are pretty good about coming up with values that they talk about, but it's how do they play them out in practice that that really matters, especially in a startup where things can get stressful. So Sarah, our last question is, it's clear as we started off the interview that you have a lot of experience. If you can boil it all down to one piece, and I, I know it's really hard, but if you can boil it all down to one piece of advice, something that you wish you did when you were younger, something that you think is the most important bit that people can understand about the journey inherit to entrepreneurship, what would that be? I think there's two things that come to mind. The first thing is about 
keeping your eyes open and being willing to carve your own path. Opportunities are going to present themselves. And if you are open to them, I'm confident that each and every one of you will make good decisions for you. I think where people get into trouble is that they're following someone else's path or someone else's plan for their life. The second thing that I would just say is so much of entrepreneurship and frankly, anything that you want to be excellent at in life requires persistence and requires staying power. And so think about what are the things that give you energy that will help you stay the course and become exceptional in a certain area. I think entrepreneurship is interesting because in order to be successful, you have to be exceptional by definition. Otherwise, you, you won't make it. But I think it's true in anything in life is that I think a lot of joy that people get in life is around becoming exceptional at something and having, therefore, a positive impact in the world. But I think in order to be exceptional at anything, you just have to stick with it for extended periods of time. And so think about all the conditions that you need to have to give yourself a chance to have the staying power. That's about who you're working with, what you're working on. Is it a growing opportunity? These are all elements that will help you have the staying power that you need to do something that has a real positive impact in the world. And, and so I just think about all of those things. You notice I didn't talk about a specific technology. I didn't give you a one, two, three plan. Like some of these are just what are the conditions under which you can thrive and then being open to those opportunities. Um, I don't think I necessarily knew that at the time that I started my career, but I'm incredibly grateful that I figured that out early on in my career. And it's led to something that's been super interesting, created a unique path that is uniquely mine and one that's been incredibly fulfilling. Sarah, that is absolutely wonderful. I think it's a great way to end the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. You are wonderful. Your story is exceptional. And I'm sure all of the listeners and all the viewers uh, will have gained a tremendous amount from listening to you. So thank you for being with us today. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Congrats to the two of you for your own startup. And congrats on launching the podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to 30 Years in 30 Minutes. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and let us know in the comments if there's anyone else you want to hear from.